Um, so I um, apologize, I, I changed my paper a little bit, but also reflecting the discussions we had in the last couple of days. So I'm still rereading Benjamin's theory of fascism, though fascism in the age of its neoliberal reproducibility is probably the title of a paper I would have liked uh, to write, but let's see, maybe there are some elements. So, fascism is originally reactionary. It stands in place of a political discourse, formation or movement aimed at the revolutionary overcoming of capitalism. In this sense, every fascist reaction is triggered by, yet not reducible, to socio-political actions within the sphere of class struggle. If fascism is a pseudo-event, which fills the void of an absent or failed revolutionary event, fascism can only be grasped from the perspective of an emancipatory struggle. Walter Benjamin's theory of fascism is written from such a perspective. In the mid-1930s, he famously stated, the masses have a right to change property relations. Fascism seeks to give them expression in keeping these relations unchanged. The logical outcome of fascism is an aestheticization of political life. In other words, the politico-economic deadlock that forecloses the changes, the chances for the democratization and communization of the productive forces inherently produces the aestheticization of the political sphere in order to keep the status quo unchanged. In my paper, I will, I will revisit Benjamin's famous dictum and try to shed light on his concepts of fascism and aestheticization. So what is fascism? Generally, fascism can be framed as the articulation of a pseudo-rebellion against capitalism in order to keep capitalism in power. It goes without saying that such a paradoxical project cannot be solved, is only derived, deduced or explained from the standpoint of bourgeois common sense rationals such as theories based on already constituted subjects or groups supposed to act rationally in accordance with their allegedly objective class interests. In other words, fascism is the violent mobilization, formation and ultimately destruction of particular groups of people, if not entire societies, in order to keep things as they are whatever the particular interests, fantasies, or goals of its agents or victims are. From such a perspective, fascism is the paradigmatic form of ideological displacement, a phantasmatically invested attempt to displace the social antagonism of capitalism from the side of class struggle to the side of phantasmatic antagonism. As is well known in the case of German fascism, the ideological screen of this phantasmatic displacement was anti-Semitism. That is, class antagonism displaced and rendered as the eternal struggle of the Aryan race against the Jewish anti-race. If one were to formulate a critique of Nazi ideology, the analysis of the anti-Semitic fantasy of the eternal Jew would be the point of departure to unravel this mode of ideological displacement. Such a critique would come to the conclusion that behind Nazi ideology there is no material reality that could be unveiled or enlightened by correct consciousness. The ideological displacement which renders class struggle as anti-Semitic race struggle is strictly speaking tautological and resists attempts to rationalize it ex post. Put differently, in capitalism, anti-Semitism is the paradigmatic form of ideological displacement which cannot be reduced to functional theories of false consciousness. Behind the ideological displacement, which in the case of fascism articulates its pseudo-rebellion against capitalism, there is only a purely social relation, the commodity form and class antagonism, the persistence of which fascism organizes. The figure to which this sort of ideological displacement was historically attached has changed in our days. It is not only the phantasma of the Jew that is being produced to give material evidence to fascist ideology. And some argue with good arguments that uh, this position is now taken by the phantasma of the Muslim. However, the systemic need to fill in the subjective position of ideological displacement to produce the subject that materializes a phantasmatic antagonism 
still prevails, whatever its contemporary figure is. <coughs> this operation of ideological displacement is not limited to the domain of ideas, concepts or beliefs. Rather, it is part of fascist reality, the material staging ground to organize formatted mass masses in order to allow for the continuity of capitalist relations of production. Starting from this minimal definition, it should be clear that in the case of fascism, we face two seemingly contradictory movements, continuity and rupture. Continuity insofar as fascism is continually run by capitalist relations of production. Rupture insofar as fascism is the exceptional suspension of most of capitalism's legal framework achieved by the bourgeois revolutions of 19th century. With this double feature, continuity and rupture, we are able to specify what in the 1930s Max Horkheimer said about fascism. Those who do not want to talk critically about capitalism should also keep quiet about fascism. Or, to rephrase this formula, those who have no critical grasp of the functioning of capitalist continuity, that is, its everyday modus operandi as permanent crisis, should also keep quiet about capitalism's fascist exception. Moreover, with fascism, our notion of normality, of so-called normally functioning capitalism, is challenged. An innovative concept of liberal capitalism, based on the discrimination between what is the rule and what is its exception, necessarily misses the character of fascism. If I say capitalism is the necessary, yet non-sufficient condition of fascism, I do not make a reductive vulgar materialist argument concerning <coughs> historical causation. Rather, in almost Kantian fashion, I claim that capitalism is the historical condition of possibility of fascism, allowing in the first place for arguments concerning historical causality. Again, it is only our critical notion of capitalist continuity that allows for a non-reductive and non-idealist concept of capitalism's fascist interruption. An interruption aimed at preserving capitalist continuity by all means. In terms of the relationship of fascism and capitalism, we have to reject explanations that employ a simple binary between causal deduction on the one hand and relative autonomy on the other. Capitalism is the necessary, yet non-sufficient precondition of fascism. However, in fascist everyday life, capitalist preconditions and their ultimately contingent fascist potentialities acquire a life of their own coexisting next to each other, rendering political contingency as historical necessity and thereby blurring the line between effects, between effect and its condition of possibility. Giving Horkheimer's dictum its proper meaning, in 1940, Benjamin said, and I quote, the tradition of the oppress teaches us that the state of exception, Ausnahmezustand or state of emergency, in which we live is not the exception but the rule. We must attain to a conception of history that accords with this insight. Then we will clearly see that it is our task to bring about a real state of exception and this will improve our position in the struggle against fascism. One reason fascism has a chance is that, in the name of progress, its opponents treat it as a historical norm. End of quote. Implicitly referring to Carl Schmitt's theory of the state of exception, in which sovereign power seeks to ground its authority, Benjamin calls for a revolutionary antithesis, the real state of exception, which could disrupt the fascist Ausnahmezustand by aiming at the exception of the exception, so to speak. According to Schmitt, sovereign is who decides about the state of exception. Martial law, for instance, that is the violent suspension of the normality of the law in order to safeguard its normal function. This seemingly paradoxical operation, the exceptional suspension of the law in order to ground and implement it, is addressed by Benjamin in terms of a state in which the exception has become the rule. Rapture and continuity exist next to each other, blurring the line of what is the normal degree of state violence. Already in his essay on the critique of violence from 1921, Benjamin tested out the limits of state violence and its supplementing powers by invoking the term divine violence, 
a revolutionary violence which can break the continuity of applied rules as laws, what he calls law-preserving violence, and the original implementation of such rules, what he calls law-making violence. Both forms of violence, law-preserving and law-making violence, mutually presuppose each other. And that is why Benjamin calls them mythic. They form a circle without exit. Put into practice, however, these two forms of mythic violence are difficult to differentiate. In the sphere of direct state oppression, like the police, law-preserving force and law-making violence are always spectrally conflated. Whereas in the realm of the social order, mythic violence has become almost invisible. While excessive law-making violence is today more or less outsourced from the capitalist center into the periphery, in contemporary post fordist Capitalism, mythic violence, tends to obscure its lawmaking force by turning into a seemingly intangible juridical web of biopolitical practices. This form of law-preserving violence operates as a self-producing and self-eternalizing microphysics of power, producing and reproducing, disciplining and controlling, regulating and sanctioning bare life as actual, potential or superfluous labor force. Mythic violence has thus become the political economy of bare life, however productive the latter's labor potential might be. In other words, state violence, as mythic violence, is inherent to the law, be it in bourgeois or fascist forms of capitalist domination. And vice versa, if rebellious movements to break the law in order to establish a new one, they remain within the paradigm of the state and its spurious dialectics of mythic violence. Benjamin's question, however, is, is there a realm of truly revolutionary politics outside and beyond of the law and the state, a sphere of justice and non-legal violence? The entire argument of Benjamin's critique of violence hinges on demonstrating how sovereign power, through the suspension of the law in the state of exception, partakes in the spurious dialectics of lawmaking and law-preserving violence. In other words, the fascist state of exception guarantees and coexists with the normal functioning of mythic violence materialized in the law. This safeguarding coexistence, a situation in which the state of exception has become the rule, creates a zone of indistinction in which the very concept of normal state violence loses its normative base. What is outside of the law is rendered as the center of legal violence and vice versa. In this sense, Schmidt's theory of the state of exception can be read as an attempt to include what is outside of the law by inventing a fictitious verb zone of indistinction, inscribing the law into nature and nature into the law. Against this attempt to ground the normalized interior of legal violence in an external zone of indistinction, in which the normal rule coexists with its exceptional suspension, the real state of exception aims at the revolutionary deactivation of both the normal bourgeois level functioning of mythic violence and its fascist guarantee in the state of exception. With this working definition of the asymmetric antithesis of fascist pseudo-event and revolutionary politics, or as Benjamin put it, the antithesis of a state in which the exception has become the rule on the one hand and the real state of exception on the other, I will move on to Benjamin's famous definition of fascism as the aestheticization of politics. For a long time, Benjamin's criticism of fascism has been summarized along the lines of this formula. To such aestheticization, as the passage goes on, communism answers with the polarization, a politicization of art. What is less known about this oversight quote is the argument upon which Benjamin bases the chiasmus of politicization and aestheticization. I'm quoting the entire passage from the famous essay from uh, the work of art in the <coughs> age of technological reproducibility from 1935-36. The increasing proletarianization of modern men and the increasing formation of masses are two sides of the same process. Fascism attempts to organize the newly proletarianized masses by leaving intact the property relations. 
which they strive to abolish. It sees its salvation in granting expression, Ausdruck, to the masses, but on no account granting them rights. The masses have a right to change property relations. Fascism seeks to give them expression in keeping these relations unchanged. The logical outcome of fascism is an aestheticization of political life. All efforts to aestheticize politics culminate in one point. This one point is war. War and only war makes it possible to set a goal for mass movements on the grandest scale while preserving traditional property relations. That is how the situation presents itself in political terms. In technological terms, it can be formulated as follows. Only war makes it possible to mobilize all of today's technological resources while maintaining property relations. Such is the aestheticization of politics as practiced by fascism. Communism replies by politicizing art. So this is a famous passage, end of quote. Ever since the 1960s, generations of Benjamin scholars, art theories, leftists, and anti-fascists have tried to make sense of this chiasmus. In the remaining time of my talk, I will not focus on what the politicization of art would mean today and to what extent contemporary capitalism has, fu has fulfilled this demand in a perverted way in the domain of so-called immaterial labor. Rather, I will only concentrate on the aestheticization of politics and how this formula contributes to a theory of historical and contemporary forms of fascism. Speaking about the aestheticization of politics, one cannot but ask a simple question. What is it in politics that is being aestheticized, which has not been aesthetical in the first place? What is the relationship of the fields of politics and aesthetics which allow for the political operation of aestheticization? Against a naive reading of Benjamin's formula, we are to insist that politics is itself inherently aesthetical. I'm tempted here to agree with Jacques Ancien, who argues that the aestheticization of politics, the assertion of its aesthetic dimension, is inherent in any radical emancipatory politics. And as Slavoj Žižek rightly summarizes Ancien's take on aestheticization, quote, this choice goes against the grain of the predominant notion which sees the main root of fascism in the elevation of the social body into an aesthetic organic whole. If aestheticization is a certain mode of pra or practice within what Ancien calls the distribution of the sensible, we have to acknowledge that there is, quote Ancien, an aesthetics at the core of politics that has nothing to do with Benjamin's discussion of the aestheticization of politics specific to the age of the masses. However, Benjamin's point was not an aestheticization of politics which turns something unesthetical into aesthetics, as paradigmatically figured in what Siegfried Krakauer called the fascist mass ornament, the monumental party rallies of the Nazi party in the 1930s Germany. The problem of the fascist representation and acclamation of state power is not its specifically aesthetic quality. As many liberals who follow the Arendtian doctrine of totalitarianism have noted, in Stalinism and also generally in later Soviet Union, so-called mass ornaments, the marching and parading of organized, of organized masses, was common practice in order to give the new Soviet state a form of self-representation. Rather, Benjamin referred to a specifically fascist mode of aestheticization that is different from emancipatory or communist modes of aestheticization. In other words, within the field of politics, aestheticization has at least two means. First, the articulation of the inherently aesthetic nature of emancipatory politics. In an earlier text from 1929, Benjamin discussed the immediate articulation, presentation or staging of such aesthetics in terms of Bildraum or image space, an immediately aesthetic space of politics or political action beyond preformatted political representations. One could also add 
according to this kind of theory of political image space, class struggle pre um, uh, predates or is the condition of established classes. There are no classes and then class struggle, rather the subjectivation, the process of the establishing of classes is through class struggle in the image space, what he calls the, the political presentation, uh, the, the aesthetic presentation of a political struggle. Second, the fascist mode of aestheticization which forecloses the image space of politics and renders politics as organically holistic displacing social antagonism to the field of naturalistic representations of social categories. Historically, the aestheticization of class struggle was figured in the idolatrous image of the Aryan Ubermen. struggle was rendered as race struggle. With these two types of aestheticization, we have to modify our concept of political aesthetics. The aesthetic dimension of politics is neither limited to the distribution of the field of the sensible, <coughs> as Rancière claims, nor limited to the field of the visual. Rather, aesthetics and accordingly modes of aestheticization refer to the realm of the sensible and the non-sensible. Indeed, one may even summarize Benjamin's innovation within the field of aesthetic theory as the discovery of a non-sensible aesthetics. With Benjamin, we are able to theorize different types of sensible and non-sensible pictorial and linguistic images within the field of politics. In terms of the specific fascist aestheticization of politics, Benjamin speaks about fascism's ability to provide an Ausdruck, expression for the demands of the masses. Such express expression does not change the dominant capitalist relations of production, rather it preserves them. However, the operation of expressing class antagonism without changing it is not merely illusionary or ornamental. It has material effects since the matter of politics is also made out of aesthetic practices. Providing masses with an expression of class antagonism does not add any further aesthetic expressiveness to politics. Rather, it violently separates the aesthetic dimension of class antagonism from the side of class struggle. In other words, for Benjamin, fascist aestheticization is the procedure of extracting a certain political imagery from the field of potentially emancipatory politics and making it a mobile, disposable tool of the representation of state violence. Despite its semblance, the fascist mode of expressing class antagonism is modern and denaturalizing performs a kind of inverse Verfremdungseffekt, alienation effect, cutting off the political form, the political from the aesthetical without allowing for the reappropriation of its imagery. Put differently, a film like Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will only functions as a fascist aestheticization once its aesthetic circulation and distribution is controlled and enforced by direct state violence. Therefore, there is no such thing as fascist aesthetics proper. The same imagery without its supporting state violence, that is, a state in which the state of exception is farcically repeated as the rule, is not inherently fascist, but open to subversion and even to emancipatory reappropriations. Of course, in the case of Slovenia, I'm thinking of the famous example of NSK, NSK, Neue Slovenische Kunst, and the band Leibach. If the fascist mode of expressing class antagonism by displacing its side is not any more guaranteed by a specifically fascist regime of the distribution of the realm of the sensible and the non-sensible, its images, representations and icons are open to subversion and can be reproduced and circulated as cultural industrial commodities, exposing fascism's mode of aestheticization. One might even add that the commodified circulation of so-called fascist aesthetics, speaking of Nazi fashion parades, symbols and so on, can devaluate their specifically fascist use value as a medium of ideological displacement. Instead of fetishizing the semblance of the aesthetic regime of fascism and essentializing it as fascist aesthetics, we are to denaturalize fascism's own mode 
of aesthetic naturalization. The materialist weapon against ideological displacement is further displacement, which shifts the original displacement to another scene, of course, the scene of class struggle. The site of this further displacement, which brings about the real effect, the real alienation effect, is also aesthetical, yet its form is different. The truly communist mode of expressing class antagonism while changing it is still to be discussed. However, we already know that it does not fetishize and eternalize its ideological mode of displacement. Its images exceed the scope of representation of state power. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I heard I'm the only one with a presentation, which is nice. So my topic is beauty and the Nazi regime of art. And I want to explain three points concerning Nazi kunst as a special case of fascist aesthetic. There will be three. Artistic beauty is important for totality. Even more after totality is a lie, and beauty itself is a lie when the political power of beauty, totality, or the whole had to be administered by force. Second point, Nazi Kunst is not a style. It is even not just a promotion of German cultural nationalism and programmatic racism. Its essence lies in totalitarian organization of cultural production as a state corporation. And third, this body, this organization managed from the hierarchical center, marches, marches with progressive steps through substitutions, which, as Katya Mandoki explained, start from art and get a terror. So let's go to the first point, which will be Adorno and Adorno. <coughs> Adorno from negative dialectics and Adorno from the aesthetic theory. Negative dialectics starts with a sentence, philosophy which once seemed outmoded remains alive because the moment of its realization was missed. And, uh, uh, aesthetic theory says it is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore, not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. And I here put uh, also German original because this relation to the world in German is Verhältnis zum Ganzen. So uh, from parallel reading, we find out that uh, this Verhältnis zum Ganzen has to be important if it's not translatable into English. <laughs> From parallel reading of two Adorno's works, Negative Dialectics and Aesthetic Theory, I propose a conclusion that art's lost Verhältnis zum Ganzen is what Nazi Kunst is about. The first book, first by birth, 1966, uh, Negative Dialectics, uh, is concentrated, among other things, upon identity and totality in philosophy, especially in Hegel and Kant. Adorno fights the idea of close totality and synthesis without a trace of negativity, and develops his idea of negative totality. He repeatedly calls identity, synthesis, and abstract universality, abstractus allgemeines, a fake and a lie, or similar. His diagnosis of the existing system of capitalism is that it is such a fake and untrue close totality of that kind. This false totality is positive. And Adorno gives the expression positive a whole new, totally negative meaning. Positive or close totality is a lie. Now we can go again to the aesthetic theory, which appeared posthumously but was written mostly in between 61 and 69, nearly at the same time. And speaking about beautiful, he says, the course towards the artwork's integration identical with the development of its autonomy is the death of the particular element in what compels the artwork to go beyond itself, beyond its own particularity, seeks its own demise, the quintessence of which is the totality of the work. Here we see that uh, this negative dialectics uh, has something to do with uh, artwork's integration. And uh, the perfect artwork, which is usually defined as something where nothing could be added and nothing should be taken away from it, it's a kind of perfection, a close totality, 
is at the same time a death of its moment in the whole. And adhering to the pure aesthetic, as essence of modernism, it kills all non-aesthetic moments of the art. In the ideal of totality, the self-destruction of beauty is already present as a threat. After an extensive explaining why beauty has become false, an untrue, a lie, he adds finally that for totality, the coherence of the parts in unity requires or presupposes to some regard the substantiality of the elements, and indeed to a degree greater than the older art, in which tension remained much more latent beneath established ideals. So modern art has more tension between particular and the whole. Indeed, it is for the sake of the beautiful that there is no longer beauty, because it is no longer beautiful. So this is a result of modernism and, of course, of uh, overall social situation. One of conclusions which we could derive from this parallel of two Adorno's work is that beauty became a sign of the absence of negation, therefore a sign of ideology and totalitarianism. National socialist art was not a fall from the hate of modernism and avant-garde into pre-modern ways of making art. They were modern. And there were two different radical ways to keep the modern, the beautiful, and the totally alive, alive for the sake of visual presence of power. But as Adorno said, both totality and beauty are lies, these two ways of keeping the project of totality alive. So how can one lie become a visible embodiment of another? Answer is by force, which includes violence, of course, but mainly it includes enforcement through organization to a totalitarian organization, of course. Before totalitarian organization of art, there was a process of purification and cleansing which included administrative change in the ranks, at all levels, and destruction of entartete de Kunst, including arson of unacceptable <coughs> books on May 10, 1933. In addition, blacklists were composed for authors and for artworks. Criteria were open to subjective interpretation because there was no central authority charge. But the field of cultural enemies was so vast that it was hard to miss. Modernists, Bolsheviks, Jews, so on. This wave of uncivil violence was so wild that more bureaucratic measures by ministry seemed to be a moderation of Nazi cultural politics after purification and cleansing went so far that only one third to one half of cultural production in different fields survived. In 1933, at the end, Germany was turned into a cultural despot. This is when Goebbels entered with his idea of organization of German culture as a corporation, responding to his ministry and himself. He established German Chamber for Culture as a central body which was managing culture in all of its fields, organized as special or particular chambers. And you have this graph of these organizations here. Nobody could remain to be or to become an artist if he or she was not a member of the chamber. Being a member meant to follow instruction of the center and to submit one's proposals for artworks, chamber's inspection and approval. Goebbels was proud to say that the chamber is in reality an art productive body and not just an administrative system. The scheme of the chamber and some of its member chambers, where you see their organization as pyramids looked up from above, tell enough. When the whole can be reached only by force, it is not an artwork which can provide the result, but a total organization in which individual artists are organized into the whole body of art. So let's go to the third point. These are substitutions. In her study, Terror and Aesthetics, Nazi Strategies for Mass Organization, Katya Mandoki determined that, I quote, Political power invariably requires orders of visibility for its production, sustenance, and legitimation. The importance of such statement is that political power is not pre-existing its visual presence. Its power depends on production of its orders of visibility. This is a general point which covers many different regimes of political power, and fascism is no exception. But there is no typical fascist regime of visibility besides monumentality, perhaps, but it is not typically fascist, as fascist regimes of culture are of many different kinds and variations. 
Nazi Kunst is a special case because of its systematic total enforcement of the production of its visibility through art. So that Nazi Kunst system represents fascist cultural politics brought to perfection, which was not reached anywhere else. Another feature of Nazi cultural politics is a systematic process of substitutions which were deployed through, and you have these six stages, which we will now tell something about. First, the substitution of religion uh, by instrumentalization of art. It means that we got a typical ritual, starting from well-known denigration exhibition of Entate de Kunst, there were, in fact, many exhibitions of this kind, some of them even before 1933. And the exhibition of new German art, which followed as the opening exhibition of Haus der Deutsche Kunst in Munich in 1937. <coughs> art was put into a temple, and it functioned as a ritual, with a special niche reserved for rituals of remembrance of German heroes of war. But we have here to remember that art became a substitute for religion already in modernist aestheticism, uh, just to keep that in mind. That was the starting point. Then second, the substitution of art by propaganda. This was done by organizations showed about, so that not even beauty as a whole was not the main reason for art's existence anymore. Its end and purpose was propaganda pure and simple, as seen in Lenny Riefenstahl's movies, for instance. Still, it has to be added that, especially on film, this propaganda was as direct as in Lady Riefenstahl's case, in just a few cases really. While most of abundant German film production of that time followed melodramatic narrative structure filled in by racist and other ideological and political suggestions, mostly undirect, turned into a discourse of visual moralization. Third, the substitution of propaganda with indoctrination, which means, among other things, then under, under Goebbels' type of organization of culture, it was no more possible to speak simply about the statization of politics, and here I agree with my colleague, I'd be glad to hear his comment on this point, because there was no place for politics at all. There was no politics. So, aestheticization of politics was not a kind of uh, uh, masking politics, of pretending of politics. It was uh, uh, getting rid Politics disappeared in aesthetization. There was just a place for pure obedient following of pure political indoctrination, especially after the Second World War broke up. This indoctrination prescribed obligatory views and opinions and made its borderlines clearly visible for potential trespassers. It was less than aesthetization of politics because it became not much more than a sign of prescribed identity authenticity from one moment to another. One of typical features is that now after 1941, uh, till then we still had these big mass manifestations with Führer appearing. After 1940, Führer did not appear anymore, which became a big problem for, for Goebbels. Not in life, not with masses, and with less and less speeches, which were, after that, mostly read by other people. They were, let's say, written by fear, but he did not speak his speeches anymore. There was special inner circle indoctrination on the other side for the education of Nazi elite troops, which was accentuated with mysticism and ritual magic, installed instead of intellectual or political argument, with this even instead of ideology. With this happy view, so instead of the cultural Leviathan organizing German culture as a whole, we got as a secularized, mass satanist cult full of permanent transubstantiations. Fourth point, the substitution of culture with monumentalism. This is a common point of all political regimes of culture. It demands a lot of investment and of human labor, but it's most monumental when it is more or less a personal project, as under fear or duce or Hazia in principle. As Matoki says, culture grows from the bottom up, whereas monumentalism is set from the top down, always. Hitler's plans for future Berlin are a remarkable case. They are so monumental that even Albert Speer found it impossible to realize them. 
But of course, the most monumental project was the formation of a mass as an embodiment of the following. Fifth, the substitution of the political by the aesthetic. Most common German art and culture during Nazi regime were party conventions and military parades, <coughs> youth celebrations, secularized religious and other festivals and many other mass occasions up to the war. Here, what was initially called body politic became body aesthetic, a body of German nation in aesthetic motion, visualizing political power in its aesthetic attire with the illusion that they, the masses, were in power because they were of an eigenly pure origin. So it was an aesthetic embodiment of racism. Six, the substantiation of the aesthetic by terror. Hannah Haren said very profoundly that only a building can have a structure, but a movement can have only direction. The movement, at the end, becomes a military march where one has a unity of a corpus and discrepant heterogeneity of the mass of individuals, which besides the corpus and its direction do not possess any other common feature. They just follow. When these marches were directed into war, there was no more need for aesthetics. What organized this heterogeneity of masses into a uniform body was terror. And what was the purpose and mission of uniform masses was terror. Speaking of the limits of metaphorical correctness, the genocide of all the others, from Jews on, but also of Germans, was Nazi Kunstgesamtkunstwerk, and not Hitler's and Speer's monumental plans, which were meant to turn Berlin into a capital. German right. To finalize this process of substitutions can always start again. And it can start nowadays without this totalitarian state organization of culture. It can start from cultural industries, creative industries, from precarity of this situation which is already a kind of distribution of terror. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Sasha. Please. Thank you. Sadly, I don't have uh, a presentation, so my talk will have less aesthetically pleasing. I'm unique. <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> um, so, if um, Sami uh, demonstrated uh, how and in what aspects um, Benjamin's uh, theory can still be significant today, um, I will focus uh, on the other part, um, a critique uh, of Benjamin uh, that puts um, the applicability of his theory, of his way of uh, conceptualizing the aesthetic, aesthetization of politics uh, in fascism uh, under question. Um, and to do that uh, cannot start um, in the 30s or even 20s, but uh, before that, uh, at the end of the 19th century, where art was experiencing a specific crisis. So to be more precise, uh, a crisis of uh, autonomy. Um, Eagle, Terry Eagleton, for example, notices this crisis uh, as an example of literary criticism. Uh, he says that it had uh, two origins. For one thing, the market has displaced the liberation of cultured publics as the mechanism of forming tastes. So at the end of the 19th century, it was not uh, anymore even feasible to imagine that you know, this cultural deliberation uh, is uh, decisive in determining tastes and uh, consumptions. It was more and more this abstract mechanism of the market. Uh, and another thing that the liberation was unable to achieve is to harmonize incompatible interests, especially between uh, capital and labor. Uh, so, as already Habermas noted uh, when discussing the political public sphere, you know, this notion of rational deliberation made sense just as long as the class interests of the bourgeoisie were the self-evident horizon of rationality. Um, 
So even at that time, even the ruling classes were bitterly divided uh, regarding the proper amount of uh, repression that was needed to keep the working masses at bay, but was still not going uh, so far as to trigger uh, a revolution. Um, <clears throat> And the symptoms can be seen uh, in various places uh, in the notion of art for art's sake, uh, the retreat of art and criticism, art and literary criticism behind the walls uh, of institutions, uh, and on the other hand, in efforts to cultivate the masses, um, to incorporate them into society, but of course not as they were, you know, as potentially unsettling, as uh, unruly, as masses uh, of proletarians with a class interest, but of course purged uh, of that class interest. Um, and one can also see, a let's say, theoretical, in quotes, accounts uh, of the crowd, as was uh, written, for example, by uh, Le Bon, the crowd, as uh, this de-individualized, wild, uh, barbarian uh, mass that is at the, one t at the same time dangerous and passive, uh, which of course means it needs a leader. <coughs> um, so at the same time that art and culture more broadly retreated from society in this realm of pure art, the focus, the practical focus uh, of culture shifted from uh, forming the work of art to forming the masses as uh, this passive material with which uh, the artist-politician works with. And this crisis, I would say, was trying, was uh, we can identify three uh, distinct efforts to resolve this crisis. Uh, one was, of course, the historical uh, avant-garde uh, about which uh, Berger uh, wrote, which tried to re-establish the, uh, the link between art and social practice to bring it uh, out of this uh, autonomous, separate sphere. But uh, it uh, remained I believe uh, anachronistic in that it still put the question of uh, Kunstmittel, uh, Berger used the term Kunstmittel, so let's say means of expression uh, at the forefront and presupposed a sort of artisanal uh, way of production and it very often related to the masses in a pedagogical way. Uh, we can see it, for example, in the flood of uh, manifestos, uh, artistic manifestos uh, at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, which are basically uh, instructs, inst a lot of times instructions for proper uh, receptions of uh, stylistic innovations. Uh, and we can also see it, for example, uh, in the case of Brecht's Lehrstücke, in which the public is included into the work of art, but uh, merely acting out uh, a predetermined script. So it still remains, um, well, if I can use the paradoxical term, the pa a passive actor. A second and successful attempt uh, to solve this crisis was advancing commodification, which is not so much uh, a conscious attempt. And we can see it in uh, Great Britain where the penny press uh, and for example cheap novels uh, very quickly displaced autonomous worker culture which was at the end of the 19th century uh, very strong, perhaps not as strong uh, as in the Weimar Republic in the interwar years but uh, still uh, very strong. Um, so in this model, which was finally triumphant, the masses are successfully integrated into mass culture, uh, at the same time that they are given a subordinate role. Uh, as uh, Bourdieu later researched, they are lacking the legitimate uh, taste. Uh, so 
both goals are achieved, the masses are incorporated, but they are purged uh, of their more wild uh, elements. Uh, and a third attempt, of course, uh, can be seen uh, in fascism, which at the same time aestheticizes politics or rather society uh, as a whole, uh, while art as a separate, separate activity basically withers away. Uh, now, on the manifest level, this can be seen in the complete and utter dilettantism of the great German art institutions uh, or the very steep decline of Italian uh, movie production. Um, but on a deeper level, uh, it's not uh, only a quantitative uh, transformation. Now, Le uh, Leo mentioned the purging uh, of artists. Uh, I think it's important that what, uh, to, to, to stress that what Nazism purged was not specific artists, but art itself. Um, so, if you know, the promise of happiness, as uh, Adorno said, is constitutive of art, uh, and uh, Adorno didn't mean a specific promise you know, of happiness, you'll get a lollipop uh, or something like that. Uh, he meant upholding the principle that happiness is above practice, uh, upholding this uh, hierarchy. It was this that was uh, intolerable to fascism uh, and Nazism. Uh, so their credo seemed to have been you know, a grotesque uh, misunderstanding to Hegel. So, the credo seemed to have been uh, whatever happens to exist must uh, be made true. Uh, so it basically reversed the hierarchy between uh, the real and uh, <coughs> happiness. Um, <clears throat> so if I look, look at two examples of how you know, to be more concrete of how politics and society was uh, aestheticized in Nazism and Fascism. Uh, one case is, of course, the Duce, uh, who often stressed that he understands politics as the art of forming the masses. Uh, here he made, uh, sometimes made reference to Le Bon, you know, this understanding of um, the masses as the passive material with which the artist-politician works. Uh, Another, perhaps more interesting uh, example is uh, to be found in the Third Reich uh, in the Bureau, Bureau of Beauty of Labor, uh, which was far part of the German Labor Front. The German Labor Front was established after unions were wiped out to substitute uh, for them and somehow coordinate the interests of uh, workers with um, capital or well, rather to coordinate the workers with the interest of capital. Um, and uh, it had the goal to make you know, the, the workplace uh, aesthetically pleasing, uh, pleasing, to transform the workplace you know, from uh, a place of undignified labor and make it uh, a work of art. Um, and in this sense, you know, the, the, workers, the workplace was not there for the workers. Uh, if I quote uh, Rabenbach uh, from the article The Aesthetics of Production, the third track, uh, so to quote, as industrial psychology, beauty of labor extended the, the domination of material nature to the nature of the worker, uh, whose consciousness was reduced to an environmental factor, end of quote. So if I turn now, uh, to Benjamin, um, um, Sami quoted uh, part of what I wanted to quote, so I'll skip that. Uh, uh, oh, perhaps if you want to hear it again, uh, I don't doubt there's need. Uh, I'd like to quote uh, another part. Uh, so Benjamin says uh, that corresponding to the rape of the masses, which are pushed to the ground by the cult of the leader is the rape of the apparatus, which is made subservient to the production of uh, cult values. And here is uh, a paradox of you know, Benjamin's uh, essay becomes uh, apparent. 
he starts off by claiming that this technological uh, innovation, uh, the, the technological means to make uh, art reproducible, uh, have some inherent uh, emancipatory potential. But then at many points, you know, he, uh, he has to face contradictions. So he has to admit that in the selection before the apparatus, you know, it is the star and the dictator that <laughs> emerge uh, victorious. Uh, and then he has to admit, you know, that uh, fascism is able to utilize uh, this technology uh, to reproduce cult value. Um, so, uh, early in the essay, for example, he says to quote, technical reproducibility of the work of art changes the relationship of the masses towards art. From the regressive, for example, towards a Picasso, it becomes progressive, for example, towards uh, a Chaplin. Um, and I would uh, in this case, claim uh, the opposite. Not that fascism blocked the emancipatory potential of uh, technology, but rather that it was blocking its potential for incorporating the masses into capitalism. Um, now, I mentioned uh, the um, Bureau for the Beauty of Labor uh, earlier, and it is hard to say how effective you know, these attempts to aestheticize the workplace uh, were. Um, mainly because if you had any grudge against the Führer or the Reich uh, at that time, you had a very good motive to keep it to yourself. Um, but it seems uh, that it failed even before you know, this whole effort to aestheticize the workplace fell victim to the war effort. After the war, war broke out, the Bureau lost, lost uh, most of its funding and it was uh, basically transformed and in, uh, incorporated into, the war, into war production. Uh, but it seems that it failed even before that. As soon as the rearmament efforts turned unemployment uh, into a labor so uh, shortage. Uh, so Tim Mason, for example, writes that authorities in 38 and uh, 39 were swamped with reports uh, of industries that were complaining that worker morale is collapsing, um, that workers are using uh, this new situation of full employment to uh, just shift work uh, if they find a better, better offer somewhere else, that absenteeism is on the rise, that workers are calling in sick all the time, um, uh, that productivity uh, is on the decline uh, and that wages have started to uh, rise. In the end, the problem was not solved uh, through this aesthetic means, but rather through more traditional means, meaning coercion, of course. Uh, the Gestapo uh, forced labor, the relocation of parts of production to labor camps, like was the case with IG Farben and um, Auschwitz. Um, so, although it's hard you know, to find histo definite historical evidence, it seemed that the masses did not really care that much about the new uh, aesthetic workplace. So, if you want to be more concrete, I think that aesthetization of politics in this context of fascism is best understood not uh, as aesthetization for the masses, something that is performed for the masses, but it is the aesthetization of the masses for the leaders. So there's a, uh, a some, somewhat of a continuity with 19th century, late 19th century efforts you know, to make the masses more aesthetically pleasing for those uh, in power, more, more pleasing to the eye, to the nose, uh, to eliminate the nasty smells uh, and their unruly nature. <coughs> um, so, if I return uh, to Benjamin and, and what this means uh, for the way he uh, conceptualized the statization of politics, um, he had a short uh, exchange with Adorno uh, on the topic of, uh, of this uh, essay. Um, 
sadly they never got the chance to, to actually meet in the end and uh, discuss it. Um, but Adorno there uh, charged Be uh, Be uh, Benjamin with, I quote, sublimated residues of Brechtian motives, end of quote now. Uh, if you know Adorno, you know that when he mentions Brecht, it's never in a good way. Um, and what I think is he points exactly is this uh, paradox, that Benjamin, in a sense, passivizes masses. He ascribes to them this dormant revolutionary potential, this desire to, to uh, bring things close to them, that is brought to light by capitalist technological development. So, in Benjamin's account, uh, the masses are not uh, the actor. Uh, they still remain, you know, the, the uh, passive material, to a certain degree, of course, uh, that is made revolutionary by uh, technological development. Um, so, to, to conclude, in this sense, I would argue that fascist aesthetization uh, of politics in, is to a large degree the opposite of capitalist commodification of culture um, or the way that uh, commodification uh, in the end solved this uh, crisis of art uh, in the sense that commodification managed uh, to solve the problem by relegating uh, art to the private realm uh, of consumption and making it, at least apparently, at first glance, uh, apolitical. Uh, while fascism uh, failed in doing the opposite uh, direction to directly politicize uh, art. interesting uh, contributions and now I'm opening a uh, debate so I'm sure that there are many comments, questions or thoughts about what has just been said. Yeah? Okay. Uh, for <laughs> so maybe I will start um, uh, and then uh, I will pass the microphone on to the audience. Um, well, I had a couple of uh, thoughts uh, during your uh, presentations, and of course, I um, I like uh, what Sami said that uh, that uh, actually um, fascism, as we have spoke here for the last three days. Fascism is not a historical era, that fascism aesthetic is not a form, it's not a style, it's something else and uh, that's why it uh, can hardly be related only to something that is uh, visual aesthetic. Um, but um, regarding, maybe if I connect uh, Sammy and Leo, uh, uh, Leo intervention, I, I would have a question or I would like to hear your thoughts about um, the, if the capitalism is a historical, um, historical sort of um, or con uh, con uh, if capitalism is a, a historical uh, necessity of fascism and if we have looked at all those points that you have shown in your presentation and connect them with, um, with the, what you said that um, Leo, that exhibition is connected to ritual, is connected to uh, something that um, is a substitute of ritual. Uh, how would you explain, uh, for example, that if today um, in politics of art or aesthetic of uh, uh, aesthetic of politics, uh, in your opinion, would be uh, in connection with um, precarious workers uh, in the culture, industry, in culture, in art, in uh, the capitalistic ideology uh, that um, 
that wants to implement uh, everything, every work, every precarious work as a creative process, as something uh, connected with the uh, nature of um, creativity, something that is a positive value here. So would you maybe, Sami and Kref, connect this to a notion with uh, maybe the yesterday, uh, also what we spoke about yesterday? Um, I think that you have stopped Sami there and maybe now we could continue on that notion. Okay, who will start? <laughs> I thought that we would quarrel about Indian and I can that later. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, so I think that uh, Well, uh, I'll start where Sasha finished that commodification was a solution to a crisis of art in this day. Yes, but this solution, of course, was not a solution to the crisis of art in this day. It was a turning of, of uh, this uh, meant to be, or thought to be, autonomous production into a capitalist production where it doesn't matter what kind of use value is produced. So. Uh, in a way, what I quoted for the first sentence from the aesthetic theory is the answer to this solution. Uh, the solution, of course, was to destroy was the possibility of art. Uh, that's, of course, just one view, but it has to do something with Benjamin as well. Uh, so this, the disappearance of aura, which was not uh, in extension discussed here, uh, has something to do with this, uh, with this process, the disappearing of aura. So I think uh, we should start to speak about what kind of solution commodification really is. It's the same kind of solution as in case of bread. It doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, this or that kind, if it's nice. Of course, bread has to be beautiful as well, for instance, and so on. But what uh, 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 is uh, important is just, you know, that mm -hmm. it brings, uh, it produces a plus value and so on. So between bread and artwork is no difference anymore after that. So this commodification uh, leaves art without any specificity. That's one common. Another, uh, which I always start to think about when somebody uses the word creative, uh, who is creative? Creative is God. Creation is, you know, another theory. It's uh, anti-evolutionary. So, to speak about creation in connection with art, it means to go back to modernist art. You can't speak about creation in contemporary art, you can't speak about creation in art. art. There is no creation. Creation is also connected with the existence of a genius, because genius is a creator, and genius because he, there was no she, genius, cannot uh, become really a god. He's called quasi-creator. But this quasi-creator is also, uh, in a way, uh, uh, less than God, because he is a genius, which means that there is something innate in, in his abilities, but he doesn't know what it is, when it is, he doesn't even know that he's a genius. Uh, he's just doing his natural thing, producing works of art, which is also, before Romanticism, what Kant says about the genius. So he is, as God, a genius, which is uh, being born, a natural phenomenon, like Hegel's uh, 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 monarch in the, the, the philosophy of right. And he's male, is he? So I wouldn't uh, speak about creative, I would think about art as production. I think thinking about art as production without creativity is a precondition to speak about art uh, in the 20th century and today. That was just a short beginning and we will add <laughs> to what it. I'm start from a, from a different angle. Uh, so aesthetics, it could be a field uh, in which we see art or art theory and then we can have a theory of what happened to art, bourgeois art, 
modernist art, avant-garde art in fascism. Or we can talk about what was the appropriation of artistic forms through uh, Nazi politicians. This had been there very well researched. Then we can talk about aesthetics as a regime of uh, the sensible, of what we can see, what we could, can perceive. We can lay out also Kant's first critique against the third critique. We can have different notions of what is aesthetics. I don't think that this has all to do with uh, aestheticization of politics, as Benjamin's formula is. I think even it is a formula that invites misunderstanding, and it's a very unfortunate one. Because, first of all, aesthetics in Benjamin is not reducible to the sensible. It's not only what you see, what you can perceive with your senses. It's also deeply linguistically embedded. That is for Benjamin, the realm of the nonsensible. So, in a purely structural way, I would say, aestheticization of politics is a movement of displacement, of moving something which has to do with the function of uh, fascism in capitalism. So, I think it's a different discussion to talk about um, polemic. I said there is no such thing as fascist aesthetics. We said it's no, not a style. So the coherent here in styles, and here we all agree. But I would even push it a bit further and say, for the sake of my own perverse hobby, I think I love to look at all these perverted, totally contradictory, ridiculous aesthetics, aesthetic forms of fascism. Of course, we all agree that this was not the problem of fascism. Even it is open to later reappropriation. The problem here was its enforcement, uh, terror, uh, displacement, state violence. So, I only uh, argued in my entire paper for please let us not take the aesthetic production in fascism more seriously than they did. I mean, they obviously contradicted themselves in every second sentence. It's wonderful to see. Uh, Deutsche Arbeitsfront, uh, German uh, Front of Workers, uh, what they proposed, what they actually did, and how they never agreed on one part. And I think this is all in your, uh, all in your argument. So I think here we would uh, agree that there is one aesthetic field of the visual, what they did. Actually, there we can see a moment of displacement, which is not original to fascism. We have also emancipatory ways of aestheticization. Aestheticization here just means a certain operation within the field of political aesthetics. Because politics is not unesthetical, it's also aesthetical. So this is no trademark of fascism. And then we can, of course, have discussion of what happened to uh, fascist art practices, or, or what they, how they treated fascist uh, art, art avant-garde and fascist practices. Kind of boring. Uh, I would say it's uh, contradictory. You know Marinetti, who called the Dutsche, uh, who said, uh, here they put my nice uh, stuff in, uh, in Art de Kunst uh, uh, exhibition. And Duce said, yeah, why? Uh, actually, these are good fascists. How can you treat futurists as an Art de Kunst uh, degenerated art? I mean, these are our people. You know, they could not even agree on who is bad guy. You know? So uh, well, how much is modernism part of, of fascism? I think there is, no, there is nothing for us to gain except for uh, an historical argument um, or out of curiosity. For us to gain would rather be how fascism manages to, within the field of political aesthetics, to uh, perform a violent shift, a disentanglement, you can say, of form and content, of how to extract, how to separate, how to make mobile, how to organize, and how to uh, enforce this with state power, and also how to, to basically use it in a way that you can have uh, exception and continuity together. The, we all know the bourgeois interior of uh, German households remained the same. Despite all of this crazy politicization of uh, working place and so on, the bourgeois interior remained intact, the same. So uh, Red Army uh, front uh, troops uh, invading Berlin in Street Fight were totally struck by that they had still the same interior even despite of uh, total mobilization, uh, total war, and uh, uh, bombing campaign. So to, to, to mobilize everything, to keep it intact, I think this is the form they where aestheticization as a certain regime within political aesthetics works. So I think Benjamin uh, should uh, uh, take in here 
not as someone, you know, this naive idea of making aesthetical what had not been aesthetical in the first place. I think this is a good uh, ground to uh, avancier. But your argument regarding uh, 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 inherently emancipatory, emancipatory potential of reproductive media, reproductive technology, I fully agree. And I would even say, this is not Benjamin's, he contradicts himself, the argument is more complicated. It's more, com it's a two competing arguments, a political one and one on the historical changes in the medium of perception, which indirectly are, they have a directiveness, a directiveness, but not a structure. There, there is no political content to new emancipatory, he says emancipatory technologies, there's rather a direction or like a, a pressure, a pressure, so to speak, which has to give a form of articulation. That is why he says, if you do not change the relations of production, we have war, or we have internal war, external internal war. So, in a way, Benjamin, uh, the beauty of Benjamin's essay is precisely you cannot extract a coherent argument from it. So, it basically mirrors back the, the entire problem. <laughs> so that's a lot of points now. Well, I think You're the last. <laughs> uh, I think we all agree that, you know, with the talk, we, if you say a statization of politics under fascism, you know, there is neither a statization in the true sense nor is there politics. So both terms are. are uh, is misplaced uh, in this sense. Um, so, uh, what, what I wanted to say is so to give a more concrete uh, view on what aesthetization, that is not aesthetization in this sense, uh, means I would put the stress whether, you know, the leaders comforting themselves that things are not so bad. You know, so, uh, when he didn't win Hitler any friends uh, when he conducted the war in the East, like it was this great drama of battle uh, between uh, good and evil, like completely disregarded, you know, tactical and strategic views of his generals. Uh, in this sense, you know, uh, one could say well, this, this aesthetic, uh, this truncated aesthetic, you know, takes the place of, uh, of politics that the leader conducts uh, himself as if you know, writing, uh, writing a play, of course, uh, the material then resists, the workers don't play along, you know, the Soviet Union doesn't play along, it doesn't just die when he attacks it, um, and so on. Um, I also found uh, interesting, you know, what Leo said, yes, I agree, you know, that this resolution, let's say, uh, of the crisis of art is a resolution in the sense that art basically died, and its autonomy was lost, and it was uh, subsumed under the culture, culture industries basically as a means of attracting audiences to which advertising can be shown. Uh, so the question then is, you know, where does that uh, leave us? Is there uh, any possibility of art uh, and aesthetics uh, after that, or um, is it perhaps like uh, this anecdote you know, that uh, Adorno and Horkheimer would, would sometimes refer to their uh, theory as a message in a bottle um, sent to some imagined future uh, recipient. Uh, and when asked, you know, what uh, another <coughs> asked, what was the content of the message, uh, Hans Eisler is supposed to have said in broad Viennese accents, I feel so bad. So is that what you're giving to you? Messages of I feel so bad to some future recipient. Well, <clears throat> all that I can say here is that, uh, you know, capitalism doesn't depend on, on, on uh, that you can still make a good brand. It's not what capitalism is about. You can make a good brand. Uh, you can still make art. But it is not important anymore. I wouldn't say that today. Fascist tendencies would go into art of a kind which was understood by, by, by fascist regimes and especially Nazi regimes with that fervor and, and, and enthusiasm. I don't think so. Because uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, the visibility of power, and I agree with you, it's not only about sensible, uh, but 
but still, uh, it's about imagination, if not anything else. Uh, this visibility of power uh, uh, does not need this Beaux-Arts fine arts, which were uh, part of the discussion. They were in crisis at the end of the 19th century. Uh, consumerist art, mass art, was never in crisis. Melodrama was never in crisis, not even at the end of the 19th century. They were producing uh, production at that time. Uh, you had uh, theaters before cinema. You had theaters in, in London uh, with uh, 30,000 people attending uh, theatrical performances and so on. There was no crisis. Yeah. So this crisis, crisis of fine art, a reduction of art, something fine for fine people, as you very well uh, developed in your in your uh, book. So uh, I would say that you know to think about. Art in this fine art sense is uh, is today too much reduction for even for a theoretical approach. That is art everywhere, but uh, uh, there is no illusion anymore that fine art is what capitalism can produce. So you would say that um, that is uh, that was the. That fine art was in crisis in the 30s, and uh, this, that, you, that capitalism has a tendency to uh, produce even fine art uh, as uh, something that is producible in capitalism, as you would. I, fine art I is don't. A concept. Fine art is a concept produced by uh, modern society yeah. and capitalism. So it's a concept, and uh, uh, this is. This concept was in crisis, as uh, Sasha said very well, already at the end of the 19th century. And you have here uh, also Adorno's conclusion that, and he thinks about finding Adorno doesn't speak about popular art, I think we can all agree about that. Mm -hmm. So he speaks about fine art, both art. Mm -hmm. And he says that it's not possible to think about fine art anymore as something necessary, something which comes out from its own reasons and so on. It needs reasons outside to be produced. But fine art is not a concept, from my point of view, uh, which we should take as a, as, a, as a universal concept of art as such. Fine art really is a product of capitalist 19th century, uh, sometimes connected very well with, with German classical philosophy, especially say Schilling, <laughs> with his mysticism, one is forget about Schilling, we speak about Kant and Hegel and so on, but Schilling is the, the winner, he's the winner of German classical philosophy. He's the victorious one, uh, uh, with his uh, magic uh, mythology and mysticism, uh, which was so, uh, so uh, uh, sympathetic to, to, to romantic circles at that time, uh, and nationalism and so on, but I will leave this aside. So, uh, we are not interested in, in fighting for fa fine art. Adorno was, but uh, it shouldn't uh, take us into, into illusion that today, in the 21st century, we have to fight to re for the reappearance of fine art. In that sense, I understand uh, Benjamin's uh, theorization of horror as a kind. Yes, there are terrible problems with this uh, concept, if it is a concept at all and so on, but it tells us something, do not go back. And that's why at, uh, at a conference we had last year, uh, we, we criticized uh, Paul Matic's idea that aura is still here. Because we have uh, fans and stars and so on, there is a lot of our things about her art and so on. You know, there is still some aura with some fine artists and so on. There is even aura with, with institutions like the Bow and so on, there are a lot. No, this is not aura. Aura is lost. If we understand that, whatever aura is, we, we, we can speak still about art without being involved with fine art, which is a special product of very special short time uh, in, in European modernity. It didn't appear anywhere else, but art is everywhere. So stop thinking about this fine art as what we have to deal with if we want to get art. Thank you for that explanation, and that is what I thought before when I said uh, this in connection with art exhibition or art institution, which is 
of course, this capitalistic invention as uh, I don't know, art history, as a discipline, as art museum and everything um, connected with it. It doesn't exist one without another and both of them doesn't exist without capitalism uh, as um, you know, uh, its mode of production. So since we are um, a few minutes into lunch, I would just ask if somebody else has a comment or a question, because we can always continue later. Uh, but um, please.